Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Henry Hale, Professor of Political Science and International Affairs here at GW and Director for our Institute for European, Russian, Eurasian Studies and uh, also Director of our Petroc program on Ukraine. And on behalf of the Petroc program, we're very happy to have with us today Dr. Paul Denary to talk about his new book, uh, Russia and Ukraine from uh, Civilized Divorce to Uncivil War. And uh, this is a really terrific book. Uh, I'd already read the first edition in 2019 and um, then was thinking, wow, how relevant after uh, the events of 2022 started. And then I learned there was a new edition coming out, which I thought was great. And so he was able to produce it very, very quickly. Um, so we invited him here to talk about it. Um, I would just mention um, he's one of the you people, I really need no notes whatsoever to talk about uh, his contributions over the years as the author of many um, books and editor of many volumes on Ukraine, Ukrainian politics, uh, and uh, I think it's fair to say, you know, certainly among the, the very top tier, maybe the best person on the kind of Russia-Ukraine over the uh, long period of time. I remember when he was a graduate student, or shortly after being a graduate student, kind of working on his first project on Russian-Ukrainian relations and economic relationship. Uh, in the early 1990s, uh, so he's been at this for a very long time, which I think gives him a great depth of perspective. Um, so let's uh, go ahead and turn things over to Paul. I've asked him to kind of talk for a while, and uh, then we'll use the remaining time for uh, discussion. All right, thanks. Thanks, Henry. That's a generous introduction. It is great uh, to be back here at GW. Um, been here, I don't know, once or twice before on various different things. One of them you were working on... Uh, that book that's somewhere patronal politics and yeah. we, anyhow it's this is um this has just been a really um a, a, a place that's that's helped me think through a couple of projects as i've been working on them so i've always been grateful to the support uh, i've received afar afar uh from uh this from the institute i also want, want to thank gabby fisher who did really efficient and clear and effective work on getting me here which turned out to be fairly complicated um <laughs> So the, the goals of the talk are really to go over the book in a very broad way. Needless to say, I'm going to skip a lot. Um, there's 200-something pages in the book. Uh, so I'm going to try to be brief and give you the sort of 20,000-foot view and then, and then let you ask your questions. Um, the goals of the talk are to talk about why the war happened, which essentially is, is what the book is about, um, and then to go a little bit beyond it to talk about how the arguments made in the book relate to... Uh, how the war might end. Uh, and, and, and just to be clear, I think our thinking about how the war ends uh, has to be related to our thinking about what the causes of it were. And I'll explain that in a little more detail. So what caused the war? And I should say uh, about the book, um, it proceeds mostly chronologically. It starts right around 1990, 1991, uh, and goes up to about August of, of last year. This is the second, uh, the second edition. It goes chronologically because I think, I, I think and I thought we needed a chronological rendering of all this because I think the order of things happens. That's going to be one of my major points is the history actually matters, especially when it gets to things like the impact or not impact of NATO enlargement. Um, that being said, I also make, I think, three broad conceptual arguments about the long-term sources of the war, uh, leaving aside kind of the immediate decision-making that went into the decisions either in 2014 or 2000. Uh, 22. So the, the big arguments are, first of all, uh, the first underlying cause of this war was Russia's dissatisfaction with the post-Cold War status quo. And I stress the point that from the very beginning of the post-Soviet era, and actually even before the post-Soviet era, right, Russia objected to Ukraine being a separate state. That's not something that happened later. Um, the second argument I make is that uh, contrary to a lot of uh, uh, treatments of this, of this conflict, um, it was not just somebody being a bad actor. Uh, in other words, security was bound to be a problem in post-Cold War Europe. It's not that there was a perfectly lovely situation and somebody had to screw it up. It was a tough situation from, from the beginning, and it was always going to be difficult for Russia and its neighbors to feel secure at the same time. And then the third big point uh, is about domestic politics. Uh, and, and that gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, the domestic politics within various states actually were not very conducive to getting along with one another, but more importantly, I point out how democratization interacted with geopolitics to, uh, to make everything uh, worse and to, and to make the conflict appear more um, unresolvable. 
So let me uh, develop each of those points in, in order. Um, Russia's insistence that Ukraine was not a separate entity, shouldn't be a separate entity. Uh, obviously, this has centuries uh, of history behind it, um, but, but I sort of pick up the story in, in 1990, 1991. Um, and one of the points that I make in the book is, and I didn't really understand this as well uh, until I went to do the research uh, for the book, which is the, the debate over the status of, Uqu of Ukraine is actually one of the things that prompted the coup in 1991 that led to the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union. The conservatives who threw the coup, threw the coup in part because they felt that Gorbachev's new union treaty um, was going to leave too much latitude for the other states to become separate from Russia, and they were most concerned uh, about Ukraine. But after this, right, and I want to I stress, um, even the Russian Democrats, and even in the early 1990s, Russian elites opposed Ukraine's separation from Russia. So just one quotation from many. Uh, Boris Yeltsin, in December of 1991, as he's headed off to meet uh, Leonid Kravchuk, the president of Ukraine, and Stanislav Shushkevich, the president of Belarus, at this famous summit in Belovezhe, where they decide to dissolve the Union Treaty of 1922. Uh, on his way there, uh, when he was leaving Moscow, he said this. He said, we must, without fail, work on a viewpoint that will prevent our three Slav states from splitting apart, no matter what happens. So again, that's Yeltsin, the liberal reformer, mm. in 1991. And lots more of that in the book. The, the reason this matters so much, right, this is before NATO enlargement is a gleam in anybody's eye. Right, so the idea that this sentiment was somehow caused by NATO, NATO enlargement, which, as you know, I think a whole bunch of people are going to argue later, it, it doesn't hold very much water, but a lot of the people arguing that I don't think have read very much um, of the history. Um, so that's the first big argument. Um, and, and, of course, I continue that story through, and, and you can just pile up these quotations and analyses over the years. Um, but again, the, the important point is that it's even the liberals, and it's very early on. That's before we even get to Zhirinovsky or Putin. Um, in the book, I also stress, though, that this is not merely about Russian aggression, um, but it's about how actors across the board respond to a sense of loss. And I invoke the literature from in behavioral economics on uh, prospect theory. Um, when actors per perceive that they've lost something, they will take much bigger risks uh, to get it back th than they otherwise would. That's kind of a, a simple way of, of stating it. So. Um, the fact that Russia felt like it had lost something uh, made it much more risk acceptant than it otherwise would have been. And I think that plays all the way forward up to, to 2022, where the idea that Ukraine is finally going to slip away uh, helps Putin say, we have got to do something, even if it's something really dangerous and dramatic. But beyond Russia's um, dissatisfaction with the status quo, which is my first big cause, the second uh, big cause is the situation, the security situation in post-Cold War Europe was bound to be difficult. And I invoked the concept from the international relations literature on the security dilemma. Um, and so I think we've underestimated, in our, in our eagerness to pin the blame on somebody, we've underestimated the extent to which the war was a result of, of these inherent characteristics of the international system, anarchy and the security dilemma. Um, this was especially true in Eastern Europe with its history, right? The Eastern European states had all been dominated by Germany, then they had been dominated by the, not just dominated by, by Germany, right, just flattened by Germany, uh, and then the Soviet Union. And of course, in the early um, 1990s, a couple of interesting things happened, right? One is there's lots of, uh, there's still Soviet troops on the ground in a lot of these countries. Uh, but then, of course, Yugoslavia blows up. So insecurity in Eastern Europe in the early 1990s is not a, a, an abstract concept. It's like, holy smokes, the Cold War's ended, and Yugoslavia is blown up. What was the solution? ultimately, for the conflict in Yugoslavia. I mean, not that we've actually solved it yet. Um, but ultimately, uh, what happened was after Russia blocked every other uh, effort to, reserve that, um, to resolve that conflict, NATO felt that it had to get involved, right? Russia's support of Serbia put NATO in the position of being torn between what they had been saying for 45 years, which was never again, never again are we going to allow genocide in Europe, and their commitment to a new security order that had Russia as a partner rather than as an adversary. So by 1994, February, when the Serbs bomb or shell the uh, market in Sarajevo, and NATO feels it's got to do something about this, 
um, there's already this fracture. Um, and everybody is looking around for security solutions. So that then is the context um, in which NATO enlargement uh, begins to be on the discussion, uh, begins to be uh, discussed. So let me just uh, give you a quotation from Andrei Kosarev, who was the very pro-Western uh, Russian uh, foreign minister in the early 1990s, so much so that in 1995 he finally got shoved out of office. And um, Kosarev says in 1994, in this famous article he, he publishes in Foreign Affairs, in response to a more famous article that Zbigniew Brzezinski had written in Foreign Affairs about the relationship between Ukraine and Russia, Kosarev says this. He says, the only policy with any chance of success is one that recognizes the status and significance of Russia as a world power. If Russian Democrats fail to achieve this, they will be swept away by a wave of aggressive nationalism. Russia is predestined uh, to be a great power. So it's the war in Yugoslavia and statements like that by the most liberal and uh, pro-Western members of the Russian elite, right, that, that, that are the, the situation in which the discussion of NATO enlargement takes place. And I think that's important to recognize. So is NATO expansion a good idea or a bad idea? We can have that argument all night. Um, but the point I'm, I'm making is it was actually done to solve some really pressing problems. And I actually think there's a case to be made that it was an enormous success in terms of all the security dogs that did not bark in Europe over the next 10 years. We could, we could debate that. Uh, moving on to, to, to domestic politics, I'll pick up with that uh, Kozarev quotation. Because what Kozarev is saying there, right, uh, just to repeat again, if, um, if Russian Democrats fail to achieve this, that is Russia's great power status, they'll be swept away by a wave of aggressive nationalism. Um, that's in 1994. And of course, already in 1993, Russian democracy was either on the rocks or gone, depending on which interpretation you want, although I think few people recognized it at the time. In the fall of 1993, Yeltsin had called out tanks, right, to disband the, the, the Russian parliament uh, because it was very, very revanchist. And one of the things that the Russian parliament was so upset about with Yeltsin was the fact that uh, Ukraine was going its own um, separate way. And of course, in the parliamentary elections that were subsequently called in December of 1993, the leading vote-getter is the so-called Liberal Democratic Party of Vladimir Zhirinovsky. So again, by, by late 1993, uh, Russian democracy looks like it's on the rocks, and what's in its place is this serious nationalism, um, which is very much against Ukraine being uh, separate from Russia. And while I think at the time we regarded Zhirinovsky as being fairly cartoonish, and actually we continue to regard him as being fairly cartoonish, if you look at the things he was saying in the early and mid-1990s, by 2015 or 2020, that's essentially the mainstream of, of, the, of Russian foreign policy. Right? Uh, so he was just ahead of his time, not crazy. Um, and of course, in the subsequent years leading up to the 1996 presidential elections, Yeltsin tax exactly in this direction in order to, to win that election. Similarly, in the United States, Democrats and Republicans in the U.S. Uh, Congress could agree on almost nothing in this period. But the one thing they really did agree on was on a hard line towards Russia. The, the Republicans largely because of traditional Republican security politics and the, and the Democrats because of their concern about democracy um, in the region. The exception uh, to the play of this idea that, um, that, that domestic politics gave everybody rewards for belligerent foreign policies, the exception actually was in Ukraine. Right? And in Ukraine, which I haven't said a lot about yet, um, in Ukraine, for most of the 1990s and, and into the, the next decade, um, the, 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 there was much more of a coalition-building politics where the idea was, yeah, we don't want to be part of Russia, but, but we need to uh, have a, a so-called multi-vector foreign policy, as Leonid Kuchma called it. And actually, that was fairly successful. And if you look at, the, at Ukraine's foreign policy from Kravchuk to Kuchma, who was president from 94 till 2004, even um, Yushchenko after that, very rhetorically different, but the substance is fairly the same, which is we want to um, trade with Russia, have good trade relations with Russia, but not integrate in any politically meaningful way with Russia. Uh, so in the West, uh, so let me, uh, sorry, changing gears slightly. Um, it became harder for Ukrainian politicians to, to have it both ways as, as time went on. 
Um, and interestingly, what drove that, uh, that, that difficulty more than anything was not security politics, but economic politics. As the EU expanded eastward, the, the cost of being on the outside of it grew, because the danger was Ukraine would then be cut off, not just from Germany by, by EU trade barriers, but from Poland. And that was a big deal. Um, and, and so by 2013, when you get to the, 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 the uh, association agreement, the zero-sum game between the West and Russia over Ukraine turns out not really uh, to be, be uh, it's not between NATO and Russia over security politics, it's between the EU and Russia over trade agreements. And, and it's the trade agreement that finally forces uh, Ukraine to, to make a decision one way or the other, and, and we know how that uh, tur turned out. But, for all this talk about democratization in the individual states, the bigger thing that I think really toxified the relationship and made it much harder to solve was how democratization became merged with geopolitics. And let me just try to say it very bluntly. Uh, if democracy in Russia was going to fail, which it looked like it was, um, then, sort of logically, there's going to be a dividing line in Europe between the democratic side and the not democratic side. And the only question was, where is it going to be and who's going to be on on, on which side of it. Um, and Ukraine did not want to be on the wrong side of it. And that's something that I would stress united Ukrainians across all regions and language groups uh, and everything else. Was there was a lot of different opinions about language policy and this and that, uh, but there was not very much disagreement on whether they wanted their country to be a democracy. So for the West, uh, democratization looked like a win-win, and this is the so-called democratic peace theory. Right? If countries are democratic, they'll get along with each other better. And, and we can worry about other things. Um, but if Russia was going to be autocratic, as it increasingly was under Putin, and if Ukraines were really Russians, as the Russian elite believed, and as Putin certainly says, then Ukrainian democracy looked like a real threat to the Russian regime. Right? Because it looked like, oh, these people who are just like us have shown that all of our claims that Russia has to be autocratic maybe aren't so true. So that was a danger. Um, and of course, there was this idea that you could have a colored revolution in, in Moscow. So the, this is why the 2004 Orange Revolution was so important. Um, it not only was an immense reverse for Russia in terms of it thought it had sealed the deal in Ukraine and, and they sort of snatched defeat from the jaws of victory, but it was also very scary for the example it provided, uh, potential example it provided for Russia. And some U.S. leaders, and I would point mostly to Hillary Clinton and John McCain, just to be bipartisan, didn't really make the situation any better and that both of them spoke quite openly about their hope that there would then be uh, a, a colored revolution in uh, Moscow. Uh, John McCain tweeted at one point during the Arab Spring something like, you know, Dear Vlad, the Arab Spring is coming to a neighborhood near you. <laughs> um, and this is, this is exactly what Putin was afraid of. Um, so essentially, though, by the time you're, you're getting towards this association agreement in 2013, um, and then after everything that happens in 2013, 2014, uh, there is this question, Europe is going to be divided. Russia's now authoritarian. Where is Ukraine going to be? And that helps drive the revolution in Ukraine in 2013, 2014. Um, it's why the European Union, by 2010 or so, becomes more adamant about Ukraine than even the United States was, because the European Union is more concerned about um, certain democratic norms and human rights and things like this than the United States. Uh, but most importantly, right, it puts Ukraine in this position where in contrast to the 90s where you could still kind of hope that somehow you were going to fudge the differences between the West and, and, and Russia or put it differently where, you, where um, both the West and Russia could feel like they were doing okay in Ukraine and the Ukrainians could feel happy, right, that yeah, we're trading with Russia but we're not controlled by Russia. Those options were slowly taken off the table because increasingly Russia was saying, uh, if you're not with us, you're against us. And it was getting harder to find that intermediate position. That was true in terms of economics, and it was certainly terms in, true in terms of democracy. Either Ukraine was going to be a democracy, and if it was going to be a democracy, it could not be controlled by Russia. Or Ukraine was going to be aligned with Russia, and if it was aligned with Russia, it could not be a democracy. And so choices had to be made. The Ukrainians, for all of their internal divisions, tried to choose democracy. Right? And I think democracy was more important to the Ukrainians than aligning with the West. We can debate this. Um, mm -hmm. And then the Russians say, not so good. So that's a fairly complicated explanation. Uh, my friend Andrew Wilson, I think it was Andrew Wilson, called it a kitchen sink explanation because he said I'd thrown in, theoretically, I'd thrown in everything but the kitchen sink. 
Um, and I, I repeat that because I don't take it as too much of an insult. Um, I think, and actually, and I've given you a very simplistic version of the kitchen sink. Um, I don't think we have been well served by simplistic explanations. Um, and so I don't apologize for one that's complicated. I'm going to call my explanation nuanced rather than complicated. <laughs> um, but in this short presentation, I've left out a ton of a detail that I would love to talk more about. Let me fast forward and, and talk specifically about the invasion of, of uh, 2022. Um, and I can go back and talk more about 2014 if you'd like. Um, how do we explain it and what do we learn from it? Um, because, and I wrote a whole new chapter on this for the second edition of the book. Um, I, as of you know, 2020 or 21, um, was not anticipating a full-scale invasion, because I thought that while the I thought the 2000 post 2015 after Minsk II that status quo, in some respects I felt like Russia had lost Ukraine, but in other respects I felt like time was on Russia's side, and so I, I thought Russia was going to stick with that that uh, w w with what was going on. Russia was consolidating its hold on Crimea. Um, over time, people were getting more and more used to the idea that Ukraine didn't control Crimea. Um, and even in Ukraine, people were saying, yeah, we know we're never going to get it back, but we're not going to say that. Um, control, Russian control of Donbass and their ability to always turn up the flames on that war in Donbass made that Ukraine could never quite move forward economically or politically. The costs for Russia were limited uh, because the war was kind of kept at a relatively low level. And Europe was getting tired of sanctions, and the Europeans still had this idea Right, that that we're gonna um, we're gonna engage with Russia positively and, and get back to uh, a, a constructive relationship with Russia. Right, they were still planning on completing, for example, the Nord Stream two pipeline. So, in the medium to long term, it seemed like everything was working in, in Russians' favor, except for the fact that the rest of Ukraine was moving decisively towards the West. So, I think the fact that that wasn't really satisfactory for Russia tells us something about Russia's goal. So, so why invade? One of the standard explanations is about irrationality, right? They overestimated their military strength. They underestimated Ukraine's military strength. They underestimated the response of the West. We know all of this. Um, and, I, and I go through that in some more detail in the book and show some of the evidence for it. Um, if you haven't watched the video of the Russian Security Council meeting, National Security Council meeting of February 21st, uh, 2022, I urge you to watch it. It is great viewing, especially... The, the part where, uh, what's his name, Arishkin tries to figure out what he's supposed to say. Um, that's kind of an example. He, like, he didn't know three days before, two days. It's kind of amazing. Um, but I also treat the other side, and I try to make the case that in Russia's, from Russia's perspective, this was actually, in, um, uh, this was rational in the loose sense of that term, rational. Um, for, if your goal is not simply to control Crimea and a chunk of Donbass, if your goal is to control Ukraine, right, the sort of uh, Putin, June 2021, 20, essay on the history of Ukraine and Russia, um, then Minsk was failing. Ukraine was integrating with Europe. The association agreement was being implemented. There was visa-free travel. Um, the pro-Russian cons pro constituency in Ukraine was shrinking. This is one of the ways in which the 2014 uh, invasion, uh, Russia shot itself in the foot. Um, not, it took all of the pro-Russian, or most of the pro-Russian voters in Ukraine, and took them out of the Ukrainian electorate by occupying that territory. And it got many of the rest of the of the pro-Russian voters to think, now nah, maybe these Russians aren't such aren't such great folks um, after all. Um, so Hen Henry and a lot of other people have done a lot of research, sort of showing how uh, after 2014, 2015, there was a lot of uh, of shifts in the way that Ukrainians identified themselves. It was not in a way that that helped Russia. The Ukrainian army was getting stronger. Um, it was f getting some experience fighting in the east, and it was being on a very low and insufficient level, re-equipped by uh, the west. Um, and the plan to use Donbass, the Donbass war, to leverage a veto over Ukraine's policy was failing. Kind of the whole Minsk strategy, right? We're going to turn Don uh, Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts into this sort of Russian toehold in Ukraine. It wasn't working because the Ukrainians essentially and they didn't exactly call the bluff, but they sort of called the bluff, which was to say, uh, we'll let this situation persist, persist indefinitely um, rather than making the concessions on sovereignty and regionalism um, that you're asking for. Uh, and so in that sense, the Ukrainians said, we'd rather let this endure uh, indefinitely, but meanwhile, the rest of Ukraine is going to march off uh, as much as it can toward the west. 
And so that was the sort of dilemma Russia had, which is if, if your goal was Crimea and a slice of Donbass, you were in good shape. If your goal was Ukraine, you were losing the battle. And then a couple of more things happened in 2021, domestically in Ukraine. Um, Zelensky turns out not to be a pushover. Uh, and then he uh, closes a, a bunch of media outlets that were controlled by pro-Russian oligarchs. And then he arrests, and I say he arrests, the unpoliticized Ukrainian criminal justice system arrests Putin's man in Ukraine, Viktor Medvedchuk. So all the indicators are going in the wrong direction. And in that sense, I would say, if controlling Ukraine is a minimal goal for Russia, I think they felt at this point they had to do something. Um, so that interpretation rests on a, pretty, on a key point, which I think has a big implications for the future, which is that Russia it was not content merely to keep Ukraine out of NATO. It was not content merely to, to get Crimea back, right? It wanted to take back Ukraine, and anything short of that was something that it was willing to wage war um, to prevent. So, questions for 2024. Fast forwarding. And I'm happy to talk about what's happened over the last 18 months of war. I'm not a military person, but um, I read a lot of that literature. Um, one of the things I keep on asking myself is, what's Russia's strategy? Um, I, think this, I think the plan still is to win the war on the ground. And we can debate this, of course. Um, I always ask myself, you know, would I want to be paying the, playing the white pieces in this game, or would I want to be playing the black pieces? And I might be want, to, want to play the black pieces here. Um, I figure if I'm, if I'm Putin, I figure I'm at least going to keep on fighting um, until the 2024 presidential elections in the United States. Because my guess is, all the indications are, including this week, right, that Western support for, for uh, Ukraine is going to ebb to the point where I just might be able to win the war without having to negotiate. Mm -hmm. or, or put myself in a position such that whatever I get at the bargaining table is a lot better than what I could get now. So when people talk about um, ceasefires, I always point out there's no sign that I can find that Russia's interested in a ceasefire. Nor am I sure they should be, right? given how things might go uh, uh, on the battlefield. Um, the harder question, I think, is what are Putin's war aims in territorial terms? That is to say, if he had his druthers, where is he going to draw the western border of Russia? Um, and he, I see you shaking your head. Nobody knows, and I'm not sure he himself knows. Right? Sometimes there's this tendency in Russian history you know, going back hundreds of years, and it's not only Russia, right? Lots of empires have this. You move into a frontier, and then you see what's on the other side, and you're afraid of it. And you say, well, we've got to do something to kind of control what's on the other side of the frontier. And, of course, the easiest way to control what's on the other side of the frontier is to move the frontier a little bit more. And, and so, uh, so it's not clear that they know exactly where they would stop. Um, similarly, it's not entirely clear politically what, what the goal now is for Ukraine. Is, he, is the goal to uh, get you, the Ukraine government to capitulate or to replace it with some kind of puppet government or what? Um, another interesting question is, let's just say for the sake of argument that things go badly for Russia on the battlefield, um, at what point does he feel like he can walk back the annexations of the entire territory of Donetsk and Luhansk and uh, Kherson and Dnipro Oblast, Dnipropetrovsk Oblast, in order to... Um, reach a peace treaty. Because as it stands, if you had a ceasefire in place, he'd be committing treason under Russian law. Because that's Russian territory. So it's, he's, he's very deliberately, right? I think this is a very clear, deliberate, it's like he's read game theory books. He's tied his hands, right, on, on any kind of uh, territorial uh, um, resolution to this war. Of course, the, the other big question I've already mentioned is how much support the, the West will give to Ukraine. Um, in the medium to long term, there's now this, um, there's a battle of mobilization and resupply. Very hard to predict how it's going to go, right? Ukraine is already suffering for numbers. Ukraine, uh, Russia is suffering for a lack of motivation, which, tur which turns into a lack of numbers and maybe turns into a lack of uh, combat effectiveness. But ultimately, you know, those kinds of things are going to determine either who, quote unquote, wins the war or who has more power uh, when they sit down at the table to negotiate something else. So my current research, I'm going to summarize really quickly, is trying to think that what happens after that. So let's just say for the sake of argument, this war, there's a, this saying, right, all wars end. And I always point out, yes, all wars end, but there's a war called the Thirty Years' War, and there's a war called the Hundred Years' War. 
And most of the wars in our data sets that international relations scholars use to study international conflict, most of those wars are the same countries fighting each other over and over again. So there's a big difference between peace and enduring peace. And, and we should be very well aware of that. And that question of peace that doesn't last versus peace that does last, I think will have a huge impact on how both sides think about uh, what they should agree to in the short term. Minsk was a peace. Minsk one was a peace. Right, lasted, what, seven or eight months till the Russians decided they wanted to get the territory around Donetsk airport. Minsk II was a peace that lasted eight years. Um, from Ukraine's perspective, right, a peace that lasts eight months or eight years may not turn out very well. Right? You might think, well, we're better off continuing to fight than something like that. Russia might feel the same way, or Russia might feel, boy, a peace that leaves us two or three more years to regenerate our force might be a pretty good deal. And so, so that's of um, the concern. Big picture is neither side really feels like it can trust the other to do what it says, right? All peace agreements rely on commitments about the future. Those commitments are inherently not credible. So then the question is who from outside can make some commitments to make those commitments credible? And this is where we get into the whole conversation about should the West um, supply Ukraine with lots of arms, so-called porcupine strategy? Should the West make security guarantees to Ukraine but not give it membership in NATO? Should the West give Ukraine um, membership in NATO? Those kinds of things are going to determine how stable or unstable the post-war post situation is. And beliefs about how stable the post-war situation will be are going to shape uh, the two sides' willingness to negotiate any particular um, terms. And so why do I make such a big deal out of this? And why do I bring it up in this talk? Because it goes back to what we think about causes of the war. If you believe that Russia is and was a status quo power and that this war was essentially a defensive war, that Russia attacked Ukraine out of fear, then you might think there's a pretty good case then that a, that a, that a ceasefire is going to hold. That Russia's made its point, it doesn't really have any desire to take more Ukrainian territory, so that if we can get a ceasefire, the ceasefire will hold by itself. If, on the other hand, as I think I show in the book and I'm arguing today, Russia was not and is not satisfied with the status quo, um, then you need something more than a ceasefire in order for a ceasefire to hold. Right? Uh, the ceasefire is in danger of being blown up uh, the very next time somebody has the advantage um, of doing it. And, and so the idea, there is, there's the argument, um, Sergei Kudelia, a uh, colleague, made this argument to me just over the weekend at the ACES conference. He said, you know, this war has been so destructive for, for even for Russia and so costly that they're not going to be itching to do it again anytime soon. And, and I think that's a, a valid point. At the same time, it's not been so destructive that they've yet shown any signs of wanting to stop it. And so maybe they've got more appetite for pain uh, than we think. And I think Putin certainly believes that he will always have more appetite for pain um, than the West. So, so uh, how do I bring this to a close? Um, I think that the problem of insecurity between Russia and Ukraine, uh, uh, I go back, I think it starts almost immediately in 1991, and I think it's going to be with us for a, a long time to come. Um, we talk about what happens after the war, we reconstruct Ukraine, absolutely. But the, um, the question of the ongoing insecurity and the possibility of the next war is going to hang over post-war Central Eastern Europe the way that the possibility of World War II was hanging over Europe after World War I almost from the very beginning. That's my argument, and I'm sticking with it. All right. Well, applaud you. for you and your research, not for the, uh, not for the argument. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> no, thank you so much. I mean, maybe if I could just uh, take the opportunity Absolutely. to ask a uh, first question, um, which is uh, you, your argument, uh, as I interpret it, is largely about kind of uh, structural causes mm -hmm. and kind of deep historical yep. causes and values that are yep. widely held uh, you know, within Russia, including the elite. Uh, yep. I, I guess like what I'd ask your opinion about would be, you know, what do you think of explanations of the, at least the full-scale invasion mm -hmm. that really pin a lot of this to Putin himself or to like the individuals? I mean, you hear everything mm -hmm. from like, well, he was isolated during COVID mm -hmm. and kind of went crazy, um, you know, to the idea, well, that he was just you know, he's always said Russia and Ukraine are one people, and yeah. this is his last chance, he's getting older, because um, the implications are, as well, like what happens if he gets overthrown, or, you know, eventually the inevitable happens, and, um, you know, does this change things fundamentally, or, um, you know, do you think that the sort of 
the aggression, the military aggressive side of those values is pervasive enough that you probably get the same thing. I know it's unfair hypotheticals, but no. the, the leadership, um, the leader uh, element, I'd be interested in your it's thoughts. The, um, it's a fair question, and it's the hardest question. Um, it's the one I struggled with the most, because uh, if I, I'm going to frame your question slightly differently, which is, so are you saying this war was inevitable? And if so, <laughs> when did it become inevitable? <laughs> it was not inevitable. Right, there's this famous metaphor of the causes of war as a funnel, right? You have these big structural causes that sort of make things, make war possible, and then things happen that, that you give you something to argue about, but there's still other alternatives, right? And, you, and it's, it's um, a stepwise, or another metaphor that's used by uh, John Vasquez is um, paths to war. And so this is a path with a lot of exit ramps. Um, and what I argue is that, that sorry to mix my metaphors, but um, every time there's a chance uh, to, like, to get off the path to war, the party getting off the, the only way to get off the path to war is for somebody to give up something that they're really devoted to, right? Russia has to give up the idea that, that it is one with Ukraine or, or that it's been done rotten by the post-Cold War order, or the West has to give up on its idea that everybody who wants to be part of the West or, or that wants to be democratic, you know, can be it and so on. Um, so it's, it's step, and, and, uh, in the book, I describe as much as I can fo could find out about what happens in those last few days. And the, argue, the, the point I make about that December, uh, that February 21st meeting is the people right around Putin did not know that this was going to happen, or at least some of them didn't, which is pretty good evidence that it was not inevitable and that the final step causing the war is Putin's decision. I, I think that's right. Um, does that mean if Putin kicks the bucket, right, piano falls on him one day while he's walking down the street? Um, that this all ends. I said, well, yes and no, um, because of these other factors. It's, there's, nothing's going to happen in Russia that I can foresee in the near future that's going to make it bad politics to pick fights with the West or to make claims about Ukraine. Right? It's always going to be, or at least in the foreseeable future, it's going to be good politics. And in fact, that politics might get a lot more aggressive in a competition for who's going to replace Putin. There might be this sort of nationalist outbidding process that I really worry about. Um, so yes, without, uh, you need Putin to uh, make that, to, for, for that very final step. Um, but it's not to say that in a political system like the one that's been created in Russia, Putins are going to be um, vanishingly rare. Um, a different way I put it in the book is to say that Putin by himself could take the country to war is to say something about the Russian political system. That makes it possible for one person to take the country to war. Is that close enough to an yeah, answer? Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Yep, great. It's the best I can do. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So uh, let's go ahead and open uh, up for questions. Just ask you, please, to identify yourself. Yeah, David Abramson, State Department. Um, nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Um, so I'm trying to, uh, as, as, as I'm related to your next project, yeah. thinking ahead, um, uh, to the extent that Putin believes, wants to continue the war and his, his, his uh, control over Ukraine, not just because he's already made the decision to get into the war, but because he still believes that he can subjugate Ukraine, mm -hmm. or most of it. Or, yeah. um, I'm just wondering, I know that he has these ideas that uh, the West is in decline, you know, multipolar world is emerging, to the extent that he actually believes all of that. Um, I'm just wondering how you are thinking about uh, his ability to subjugate Ukraine in, a, in a, a, a world, in an Eastern Europe, where Poland and Hungary, well, now more Hungary, um, is, is leaning in, in, in other directions um, that would possibly make this a more um, you know, feasible project for him, yeah. um, and maybe other he sees other things going on. I, I'm not sure that he he thinks that strategically down the road, and he it's more yeah. that he sees his opportunities that come up around. But that's kind of the gist of my question, and yeah. and, and, and what's driving. This. Yeah, and I mean, I think your your point about strategy is an important. One. I think the the cliche has become. Um, I felt like I invented this, but I'm sure I, I'm somebody. Else, a lot of people maybe invented it at the same time. He's, he's a better tactician than he is a strategist. Um, he's very good at, like, here's the opportunity, I'm going to go for it. But playing three or four moves down the road, maybe not so much. Um, 
As far as, as I think he is a little bit blinded on Ukraine. Um, I, I don't think he can really wrap his head around the ideas that Ukraine, the idea that Ukrainians don't think of themselves as Russians. Um, and I think he thinks that's propaganda. And, and I think there's this long tradition in Russian nationalist discourse, right, that Ukrainian nationalism is not just fake, but it's a Western plot against Russia. Mm -hmm. And so I, so I think it's hard for them to see. And, and the reason that actually scares me is because I think, um, and we've seen this in the places where they've occupied, right, is the people who won't sort of uh, go along with Russian occupation, um, they either get killed or, or just driven out. And so, and, and you know, we, we've seen this in some other places. Um, one of the reasons, you know, we, we talk, uh, the, the thing he has to fear is an insurgency. And you think about, I, I used to say, you know, this will make Iraq look like a Sunday school picnic. Except that the Americans in Iraq, for all the things we screwed up in Iraq and for all the bad things we did, we were all, we had always these incredibly limiting rules of engagement. And when the Russians take over some place, their rules of engagement are not very limiting. <laughs> and, and actually, if they were to drive not 5 million, but 25 million Ukrainians westward, that would be a double good for them, right? They would be depopulating Ukraine, sort of like they did with the Chechen cities. Mm -hmm. Just depopulate them and move somebody else in. Um, and then, of course, you've created a refugee crisis for the West, which is going to further split the West. So that's what... So, so I don't think he's got a long-term strategy for how he's going to, quote-unquote, govern Ukraine. But I think his strategy is a much more post-World War II strategy of just massive population movement than we can even maybe conceive of because we, we still assume some parameters that he doesn't assume. Does that make sense? Sorry. I can tell you're not satisfied. Do you want well, to... Well, no, I was just thinking about, like, in a way, it's kind of a, a, an archaic way of looking at things. Um, I mean, NATO still, will still yeah. exist. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's not like you can grab the Baltic states, small states. I mean, Ukraine is a big yeah. place, and yep. to yes, there's a lot of population yeah. movement, but but I, maybe, yeah, but I, I I I'm not sure that he he. I think, think you're right. It. I mean, I think in the big picture is is um you know there's this. No, sorry, I won't even tell that story. Um, it's yeah. Once you get it, what are you going to do with it? Um, it's almost like, yeah, you've, you're France and you've decided you're going to like retake Algeria and refight the Algerian civil war. I, I think that's right. Um, I guess what I was saying about depopulating is not that it's just going to happen like that. My fear is that if Russia is able to defeat the Ukrainian military and tries to reoccupy Ukraine, it will be a bloodbath like we haven't really wrapped our heads around yet. Because I don't think the Ukrainians, but a majority of them are just going to cave in and say, okay, we'll speak Russian now. Um, I think it's going to be awful because of the scale. Okay, great. Yes, please. Uh, the visiting scholar. Oh, thanks a lot. It's a uh, very interesting talk and a lot of ideas to discuss. Uh, my question would be related to uh, what you've been talking about, Western commitment, mm -hmm. and partially also uh, to the Western role before the invasion, because one thing that you talk about is uh, the, let's call it the mixture of, uh, well, let's say the Western geopolitization at some point and uh, connection it to where Ukraine should be, but at the same time, with sanctions, etc., but at the same time, we can have an argument that the Western approach, or at least the Europe's uh, approach, has been too lenient to Russia mm -hmm. after uh, the invasion in 2014, mm -hmm. and that to sort of degree send their own signals mm -hmm. to Moscow, mm -hmm. and hence we can say yeah. Russia didn't expect, mm -hmm. and Nord Stream actually is a very good mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. And in this regard, um, so in this regard, uh, West is kind of an elephant in the room, which, mm -hmm. which is a sort of trigger or uh, how Russia views these things. And that relates exactly to what you've been talking about. Uh, what kind of a commitment, if we talk about um, the future and the war, given that uh, there is really sort of a too few options uh, between NATO membership, which is kind of a during the war kind of a impossible. And uh, what we have now, which is uh, just uh, assistance, uh, which uh, sustainability is in question. So uh, where can we go from here? So what do you can actually offer Ukraine to prevent this bloodbath in a way? Yeah. Um, so let me go back first to what happened before the war. Um, yeah, the EU, you know, the, the EU and the United States, in different ways, um, did what democracies actually are good at, 
which is they, they found compromise. But in this context, compromise often ended up being the worst of both worlds. So for example, the, the, the uh, Bucharest summit, 2008, right? We said, well, we're not going to let Ukraine in, but we're going to make this very, very, I mean, this so-called promise, right? Which was someday, right? And I think everybody under, under, understood at the time that, that someday was diplomatic speak for never, um, but maybe not. Um, but it, but it was this idea that, holy smokes, they're not letting them in now, but they are going to let them in sometime in the future. So the clock is ticking on our chance to stop it, right? Um, Tim Colton and, and uh, Sam Chair, who I disagree with on a lot of stuff, I think get the spot on when they say that it was the worst of both worlds. The same thing you can say about a lot of the EU policies. Um, and so, yes, um, let me try to get at this point slightly differently, because it does have relevance for the future. You look at the amount of assistance the United States has given to Ukraine to fight this war. And you look at the amount of assistance that Western Europe has given to Ukraine to fight this war. And you ask yourself, if, if those actors, the US, NATO, the EU, had made it clear prior to 2022 that that's what we were going to do, would Russia still have attacked? And the answer is probably not. So it's, a, it's not only, I mean, we want to say, oh, um, Putin misperceived. But we did a terrible job of signaling our commitments, in part because we didn't know what they were, right? I think we surprised ourselves that we actually did something, right? And it's because we were surprised at the scale and the brutality of the invasion. And so that's a signaling failure. It's, and I think it will go down in history as a classic signaling failure, as well as a misperception on Putin's part. So how does that relate to the future? Well, we're signaling right now, right? Everything we're doing, every weapon we send is both has a kinetic impact, it blows something up, right? And it's, it's seen as a signal, and of course, as the previous example shows, these signals are notoriously hard to um, interpret. Uh, so, but what is, what is Putin reading from the signals that we're sending? What are the Ukrainians reading from the signals that we're sending? I think what they're reading is, is um, I think the Russians are reading the signal that time is on their side. And I, I actually think the Ukrainians are, are um, in, in some form of denial because they realize that, that if the, you, the West cuts them off, they realize how dire the situation is. And so they're hoping against hope that, that something changes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, Jill Doherty, Georgetown University. Uh, really interesting. Um, you know, I just wanted to take that terrible scenario that you have mm -hmm. of Russia depopulating, you know, moving in Russians or others, mm -hmm. uh, complete bloodbath. And then, and then what? Let's say that that actually happens, because mm -hmm. there are a lot of people who say, he won't stop there, he'll be in Tallinn next. So do you think that, that um, he'd be sated with blood at that point? Or that, that he, I mean, really, truly, would move on to Poland, the Baltics? Those are two different places, but still. Yeah, these are huge questions. Uh, I'll say a couple of things. You know, the, there is that school of thought um, in Russia and in Ukraine and elsewhere that actually the West strategy is not to help Ukraine defeat Russia, but to help Ukraine wear down Russia to the point where Russia can't attack the things that the West cares more about. Mm -hmm. Because we know, for example, that the Baltics are completely vulnerable mm -hmm. militarily, right? We've made the Article 5 commitment, but we cannot, at least at the current time, defend them with anything other than nuclear weapons. We now have this much longer border with Finland that is basically um, undefended. And so, yeah, there, there is that argument. Um, I, I am guessing that, uh, to the point that, that Russia's, the cost of subjugating Ukraine would occupy Russia for years and years to come. I don't think it's going to be a quick bloodbath. Mm -hmm. um, um, I also think, I, I, you know, I don't like to say too many nice things about Vladimir Putin, um, but I think it's worth recognizing, again, the dogs that don't bark, which is uh, whether it was 2008 or 2010, or especially after 2014, if Putin really wanted to mess with NATO, if Putin wanted to destroy NATO, right, all he had to do was take over the Baltic states. He could have rolled the tanks in. He could do it tomorrow. But, but well, they, you know, they, they're bogged down in Ukraine now. But we let the Baltic states in, and if you look at the geography, there's kind of this thumb sticking out there, and any military person will tell you that, right, just, it's a tiny little territory, undefended, and the Russians have this massive military. That would leave us the choice of either trying to reinvade that territory and, like, fight a tank war with Russia, 
Or what? We're going to nuke Moscow because they took over Tallinn, right? I think everybody sort of believes that, oh, we would have had to just suck it up, at which point the Article 5 guarantee would be shown to be hollow. The fact that Putin did not do that, right, and I always assume if I can think of it, he can think of it. Um, the fact that he didn't do that says that he's not completely aggressive or uh, completely inured to potential costs or that he's uh, not thinking about the possibility for things to accidentally escalate to nuclear war. Uh, you know, th th there are things he could have done that he hasn't done, and I think we should recognize that. Uh, but yes, the, the bigger question of where does this end, mm -hmm. so this is Paul Denieri's very simple version of history, is going back 500 years, the western border of Russia has tended to be wherever Russia's forces have ended up at the end of whatever the most recent war was. <laughs> Um, there are some exceptions, right? They evacuated northern Iran after World War II. They pulled troops out of uh, Austria after World War II, both under considerable diplomatic pressure from the West. Um, you know, they're not still in Paris. They were in Paris in 18, whatever, 15. So there are some exceptions, but not too many, right? The lines uh, of control in Europe after World War II were essentially where the Red Army ended up in May of 1945. So I think, now, they didn't annex all that territory. They surely control it. I don't know. Yes? I'm Katerina Shinkaruk. I'm teaching here at the Bush School in DC. Uh -huh. Thank you very much for your talk uh, and for your work on, on, on this, of course. Uh, my question is probably about the broader picture. Like, Putin himself uh, claims that this is not a territorial um, a war, this is a war about rules of the game or re rewriting the, yep. the fundamental principles, as he says. So, uh, we may consider whether he is uh, looking at it from the perspective, as you mentioned, of post-World War II uh, situation or post-Cold War situation, which he basically was uh, discussing with uh, um, uh, U.S. Uh, partners in 2021, which ended uh, nowhere, but still uh, this conversation to me uh, seems very uh, illustrative of what his goals might be for the, for the bigger picture. So my question is uh, about whether we can even consider Ukraine as an end rather than a means for his, uh, for his um, broader uh, goals of rewriting yeah. a security order, at least in Europe or even more, more broadly. And f what can, whether, whether you agree with this perspective and what can we drive from this perspective in terms of the end game? Okay. A couple of different important things there. Um, first is the rules of the order. Um, yes, this is what he says. But the order he's promoting, just to confuse the historical epics a little bit more, he seems to be promoting actually the 19th century order, right? He wants an, uh, an order of multi-power, great power politics. Okay, fine. That's the, that's the order. But that was an order in which territory changed hands very frequently through the use of war. That, that was, the, the idea that we don't just swap territory based on wars really is a post-World War II invention. And it's, it was invented because of the destructiveness of World War I and World War II. Right? Prior to that, all of history was, especially in Europe, was moving boundaries 10 or 20 or 100 miles right, with a war. Um, so you can't disassociate the territory from the order because the entire core of the post-World War II order is that we don't change territory by force. Um, but, but to your broader point, the idea that he wants a, a different post-World War II order, uh, yes, but, but what does it mean? Right? It means Russia has a veto. What is that Russian veto going to mean in practice? Well, it's going to mean a whole bunch of things which have to do with territory. Right? It's going to mean Serbia controls all of Yugoslavia, etc., right? etc. Cetera, et cetera. Russia controls Ukraine. Russia has a sphere of influence. So I don't. Th I, I think the. Um, I think it's artificial to se to separate the territorial questions from the order because the orders are largely about territory, and vice versa. Um, but you raise this broader question, which I think is really interesting, which is kind of um, what's his baseline motivation, right? Is it about territory? Is it about order? Is it about some end state for Ukraine? Um, and I raised that earlier, and, and all I will say that I haven't already said is that. You know, for politicians, 
you don't always have to have a single motivation for things. In fact, the things you love the most as, poli as a politician are the things that serve multiple goals. Right? So, so snatching back Crimea in 2014 is a great example. You get a chunk of territory that you've always said was yours. You've stuck your thumb into the eyes of the West. You've uh, achieved a strategic, a geostrategic gain in the Black Sea, and you've run your domestic popularity up, rankings up to 90%. I've seen people argue that he did it for domestic politics. I've seen people argue that he did it for the naval impact in the Black Sea. I don't think we have to separate those all out, because I think in the real world, politicians do things when they think that they'll serve multiple goals without really undermining anything that's really important to them. So I'm not sure in his own mind he, separate the, he separates these things out. So sorry that's a long answer, but it's because he asked us a good question. All right, maybe time for one last question. Yes. Yes. No, no, it's good. Perfect. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Alexander Hitsum, Kharkiv National University, Ukraine, and Peter Sherlock uh, here. Uh, my question is about uh, a Russian perception of Ukraine mm -hmm. before invasion as a weak state, mm -hmm. as a yeah. failed state, and interpretation of uh, multi-centric Ukrainian political system yeah. as a sign of uh, weakness yeah. of Ukraine as a, as a uh, state, as a democracy, and uh, uh, and uh, underestimation of, uh, of Ukrainian uh, state capacity. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if the link between uh, timing of invasion, I mean 2022, yeah. and change of uh, status quo in post of state, and especially in Ukraine, I mean a shift from um, hybrid post-Soviet regimes to uh, some kind of competitive democracy, uh -huh. especially after the Euromaidan revolution and especially after the uh, uh, Zelensky presidency. Uh -huh. So, uh, because uh, all of uh, status quo, so the first one and second one, yeah. I mean, uh, disintegration of Soviet Union and uh, security problem, um, in the post-Soviet states is an imminent uh, and constant uh, structural factors. But 2022 is a decision mm -hmm. after uh, some uh, shift in domestic Ukrainian politics. And after and you, you, you can look to Kazakhstan after the Nazarbayev yep. and January events in Kazakhstan in yep. 2022. Yeah, okay. So there's two, two things here. One is about the timing of the attack, and the other is about the Ukrainian state. Mm -hmm. um, the Russians completely got the Ukrainian state wrong, but so did everybody else. Right? The Ukrainian state turned out to be incredibly resilient, and in a strange sort of way, the same things that made it hard to govern the country effectively um, also made it incredibly resilient to attack which was there were all these social networks all over Ukraine, and people right, just did all this stuff. Um, and at the same time, eight years of war had actually got the military to be a lot more effective. And it was this combination of a military that was kind of outgunned but, but effective with what it had, and all these other actors uh, made Ukraine incredibly, incredibly resilient, and nobody really anticipated that. But you get at this question of why do they attack when they attack. And that, I think, uh, that's a little bit vexing because... Um, I point to a bunch of things that happened. The most recent one, the sort of latest one, was I think the arrest of Viktor Medvedchuk in mid-2021. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and that's about the time, right, that they start moving troops to the Ukrainian border, April 2021, I think is when the, big, they, the first big shipment of troops goes. Um, so it seems like at least in, in March, April 2021, Putin is at least saying this is a real option because he's starting to put the troops in, in place to do it. Um, why that timing? Maybe the push factor was Medvedchuk getting arrested and those stations getting closed. Um, but even then, you could say, okay, you've got the, the rest of the future to do this mm -hmm. attack. And so I also wonder, was there some sense in Russia of some window of opportunity that was closing? And the best I can explain it, and I'm really just speculating here, sort of really just pushing too much of my logic onto Putin is, yeah, once this stuff happens in 2021, he decides, yeah, this is not going our way. We're going to have to do something about it. And once you've decided you're going to do something about it, you're going to take the time to get your forces in play, but then you're going to, but then you're going to let it rip. And I think you're going to let it rip uh, sooner rather than later, because slowly the Ukrainian army is getting more arms and training. Uh, 
He's probably got something in mind related to um, uh, elections in Russia, and, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, one other thing that, that could have played a, a role in timing that we haven't talked about is the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, there is this argument that says that that was such a mess and that it was seemed to be such a clear example of the Biden administration's unwillingness to do to, uh, let's just call it isolationism, right? That, that, that this was sort of a thing that says, yep, we've, as long as Biden is president, we've got carte blanche, so let's go. Again, I think it's probably a lot of little things put together that says it's not. All right. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but this has been a fascinating uh, conversation. Thank so I uh, highly recommend the book. There's uh, lots of great stuff in there. So I certainly encourage people to uh, get yourself a copy. And uh, thank you so much, Paul, for joining thank us. Thank you. Happy to do it.